Hey, 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 everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. Uh, please join me in welcoming our special guest, uh, me. Ah, thank you. Uh, thank you, me. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a real honor. Of course, man, of course. Uh, so let's just start this off by saying um, you look really snazzy for somebody who typically dresses like a hot pile of garbage. You came in here looking really great today, uh, and I just wanted to shout you out because I know usually you don't. So so that was pretty pretty great. Huh? Have you ever received a backhanded compliment, or as Britta might call it, a comp assault? Call it a comp assault. Part compliment, part insult. He invented them. I coined the term. See what I just did there? That was an explainer brag. You never really know what to do with yourself. You just kind of stand there like... Uh, okay then. But comp assaults also have a close relative, like a first cousin or maybe even a brother, which I like to call disrespectful praise. While that might sound like an oxymoron and you might think I'm a regular moron for saying it, it's not actually too far off from the whole comp assault idea. Disrespectful praise is when you're applauded for doing something, but the reason for that applause is tainted somehow. A good example off the top of my head is when teams around the NBA and media praised Becky Hammond, the assistant coach for the San Antonio Spurs, for just being a female assistant coach and potentially future head coach. And she made a statement saying, uh, hey, please hire me because of my skill set, not because you want the optics of uh, hiring someone with a, a, a genius. If there was a theme for this Ghost of Tsushima retrospective video, it'd be birthday because that's the best theme. But if there was a second theme, it would be these two siblings. The unholy offspring of kind words and blatant rudeness, comp assaults and disrespectful praise. The comp assault part, unfortunately, comes from me. And I say unfortunately because I love Ghost of Tsushima. I really do. It was absolutely absolutely one of my favorite games of last year, and Legends made it even better. But if I want to talk about Ghost of Tsushima objectively as a reviewer, I'd be remiss if I didn't address the big but about this game. And yes, that is a Finding Nemo reference. I, I, I do make topical content, how could you tell? The but, in my opinion, is that the game is slightly lacking in originality, which holds it back from what it truly could have been considering how well it executed on every individual thing it focused on. My comp assault for Ghost of Tsushima is that it's the byproduct of perfectly executed, unoriginal originality. And over the next two sections, I'll be diving into both of these sides in detail, but for the last section of this retrospective, I wanted to touch a bit on the game's reception, in which I believe it received disrespectful praise. And to be clear, not all of it was like this, a lot of the love for this game was very authentic and well-meaning, but there was a certain situation, a certain comparison, and a certain type of fan that was showering appreciation on this game in ways that were frankly unfair in my opinion. They reduced the impact of this game and used it as ammunition against some something else, and I think Sucker Punch deserved a lot better. If that's confusing you, don't worry, we'll get into it really soon. Let's discuss the perfect execution, unoriginality, and disrespectful praise of Ghost of Tsushima. First and foremost, the game is beautiful. Listen, this game does not have the pure technical prowess in textures and face models and lip syncing that other studios such as Naughty Dog, Sony Santa Monica, and Rockstar have displayed, but Ghost of Tsushima looks just as good in my opinion as games by those other studios, and it's through art design and more specifically, colors. I'm convinced Sucker Punch invented new colors just to put in this game because there's so damn many. They literally took the color wheel and went... that I am not talking about how this game looks for the rest of this video. Why? Because you already know all of this stuff. I have a hard time believing that anyone who watches this video will have never played or seen gameplay or seen videos about this game before. So much of the discussion around this game is centered around the visuals and I just want to talk about other stuff, you know? The first thing I want to talk about in detail is the combat. Combat in this game is a clever mix of systems that equip you with full control, your Sekiro's, your Neo's, your Assassin's Creed's, and the structure of free-flowing combat systems like the Arkham and Spider-Man games. The reason for this is, according to Sucker Punch, to recreate the type of fighting you see in martial arts and samurai movies, where the character is crowded by a ring of people who attack one by one. It's not very realistic, but it's the perfect way to give you a power fantasy and allow you to take on any number of enemies, because let's be real, if they use their brains and attacked you all at once, I don't care who you are, you basically got put into a human version of an apple cutter. You're not stopping any of these people from gutting you like a fish. Or an apple, which makes way more sense with the metaphor I just made. I don't think people realize just how well thought out this combat system is. Let's say we started out with basic Arkham combat, but with a sword. 
Bing Bang Boom, we got Shadow of Mordor. Not everyone likes this style of combat, but a lot of people do, me included. However, this combat only thrives through exaggerated motion. Batman flipping and diving over people to reach an opponent and then folding them up like he's trying to make an origami crane. Talion rolling over dudes and stabbing them in the face with a dagger. This is some of the most hand-holdy type of gameplay that you'll ever experience, and because of that, it's got to deliver in the sauce that you're putting onto this very simple combat steak in order to make it appetizing. I, I was very hungry while writing this. But Ghost of Tsushima is committed to being authentic to samurai style combat, which means quick, efficient strikes, not backflips and daggers through ears. So they instead decided to keep the part of the system which sends people at you individually, but gave you far more control over your player. You had more agency in exactly how you attacked, when you parried, and when you dodged. Unlike a game like Arkham, you could pick your spots on when to attack and when to defend, and exactly how you wanted to do both of those things, and unlike a game like Sekiro, you were placed in a cinematic, heavily structured set piece every time you got into a fight. Now that's fine and dandy and everything, but here's the issue. That's kind of boring, sorta. <laughs> in not being given the freedom of a typical third-person melee game, you never have moments where you feel pressured by numbers and you always need to be alert of where you are and where your enemies are in relation to you. And you also never really feel overwhelmed by a large number of enemies, there's just no tension. And in not being able to perform ludicrously violent attacks while flinging yourself all over the place, you don't get the gratification of over-the-top combat. Basically, it's a little mindless and that mindlessness is not turned into big dumb fun. This can be enjoyable for a while, but it was not gonna fly for an entire 20 to 60 hour game. And in order to remedy that, Ghost of Tsushima took another page out of the existing combat mechanics playbook. Stances. In slowly introducing new enemy types which forced you to switch up your stances in order to combat them, each with their own special move that was effective against these enemy types, Ghost of Tsushima found the perfect balance of what it wanted from its combat. You were still fighting one enemy at a time, but the short amount of downtime between each dude that stepped up to you was now laced with a tiny bit of strategy. Every time you were attacked, you had to see whether you had to simply evade this person and maybe go at an enemy type that you found troublesome and switch up your stances in doing so, or if you just try to counter your current attacker and get that out of the way. And you also had to consider just just how aggressively you could pursue someone before somebody behind you would maybe throw an unblockable at you, since a lot of these special moves that were so effective against specific enemy types were a tiny bit time consuming for you to use effectively. Pulling off a combat system that didn't feel inauthentic to the style of samurais while also trying to replicate movie style cinematic group battles was a much harder undertaking than it seemed. It would have been really easy to mess this up, but Ghost of Tsushima pulled from multiple sources of inspiration and kind of slammed those ideas together in a way that works way better than it had any right to, to be honest. I know I spent a lot of time here breaking down this combat system, but I think it's a good microcosm of my thoughts on this game. It's fantastic at taking other systems from other games, jotting down notes, and then putting it all together in order to get the desired effect. I think the combat execution, considering what their intention was, was perfect, and it came as a result of mashing a few other existing ideas together. But you know, combat is one thing, a lot of games have good combat. What's even harder to pull off oftentimes is the open world elements. Now, I've been critical of open world games in the past, specifically in this video right here, but with Ghost of Tsushima, despite being open world, I was actually motivated enough to get through all of its content and obtain the platinum, so... Why is that? First of all, the game's leveling and difficulty is handled way better than so many of its open world contemporaries. At least the style of open world game that this is, because obviously there are a few different types. There's no level gating with missions, which is something that I've always hated, and instead the game gets progressively harder through its enemy types for the most part. The juggling act you need to perform gets more complicated as more enemies are introduced and you need to switch up your styles more often. The enemies don't just do crazy damage or take an insane amount of hits to kill or anything like you usually get in these games, but instead you have to duck and weave in more complex ways as you get further along. I like this approach a lot. Most of the time, open world games just kind of make things hit harder as you go along, so you need to boost your stats in order to deal with them. Basically, if we go back to me calling this a juggling act, that'd be the equivalent of making juggling harder by adding spikes to all the balls, so you gotta get yourself special gloves to deal with it. But in Ghost of Tsushima, it raises its difficulty by just giving you more balls to juggle as it goes along. It's more natural, more fitting for your increasing skill level, and is a much less obtuse system than just shafting you with a a bunch of pointy objects. Also, very cleverly, the game uses a twist at the end of its first act to introduce an enemy type that doesn't require a different stance, but is much faster and harder to deal with than the mongoloid boys. And because of the nature of this twist, these enemies also start occupying the earlier sections of the game. The story splits this map into three sections, and the later two are unlocked once you complete acts one and two respectively. So there's kind of a built-in indicator of where things will be a bit more difficult, but this one decision made sure that if you go back to the beginning area, it won't be piss easy and you'll actually still enjoy 
enjoy yourself. On top of that, the game layers its methods of allowing you to improve your combat skills very well, with some skills being gained by the typical route of earning skill points by doing stuff around the world and then using those to learn how to perfectly dodge or parry, etc. And then other stuff like health upgrades, resolve upgrades, and more powerful attacks coming as a reward for simple world activities. Usually the level system in games is to encourage you to go out doing side quests and bumping up your level so you can continue the main path, but here the game doesn't force you to have to do a lot of that side content to continue. You're able to do it of your own volition, and if you choose to do so, you'll get rewarded for your troubles. Since the game does section itself off into three parts also, it's able to control the amount of bamboo strikes, hot springs, and mythic quests, ravens, banquets that you get to access at any one time, which are the activities that upgrade those three things I mentioned just now. So basically, it gives you the freedom to go off and upgrade yourself however you want, but it maintains control to ensure its difficulty curve never gets too out of whack. And speaking of those activities, I think a fitting final thing to talk about in terms of the genius execution of this game is in how the open world icons and activities are laced beautifully into the overall world of this game. I think everyone kind of hates the tedious, unnecessary map icons for open world titles that end up just being the 40th of 112 scrolls littered throughout the game. Their existence might not detract from your enjoyment too much, hell I even enjoyed Origins quite a bit despite it containing some of my biggest open world pet peeves, but basically everyone is aware that they're just lazy attempts to try and artificially increase your playtime and boost how many things it looks like the game offers when you take a quick glance at the map. While Ghost of Tsushima's situation isn't all that different, I do want to shout it out for the fact that A, it gives rewards way more often for doing this stuff, including giving you different cosmetic items or improving your player like I just mentioned recently, and B, the game incorporates these things incredibly well into its world to the point that they seem a lot less unnatural than they usually do. Birds and smoke and foxes will intermittently show up in the world and following them will lead you to something useful or fun, which is a fantastic way of providing a visual clue to the player in the least intrusive way possible. The nature guides you to activities, it's brilliant, and it really lets you turn off your HUD and never look at the map if you want to minimize the gamification, and you're still able to stumble onto important locations like you would if you were playing the game with all of those things. The actual activities themselves are also picked out very purposefully. A hot spring for you to chill in is great considering the scenery of the game and how relaxed some areas can make you feel. It's an in-game breather, and that connects really well to why it boosts your health. The bamboo strikes require quickness, precision, and discipline, so gaining resolve is a fitting reward. Not to mention just the idea of using real-life techniques that people use to hone their skills and placing them in this game was a stroke of genius. There are shrines all over the place which set up nice, simple parkour challenges, and these shrines exist in real life, and for your goal to be to reach them atop whatever small cluster of rocks they found themselves on and pray and enjoy the scenery is dope. Finding a place to sit down and write a haiku, even fox dance, it's really just glorified rocks that you find all over the place, but they still added at least a little bit of a nature element where you allowed a fox to lead you to its home, and you can interact with it on doing so. These activities just sort of make sense in this world, and for what they are in essence, it's surprisingly enjoyable to do all of this stuff. But, the actual core of this open world system is deeply flawed, so while at a microscopic scale each of these decisions are a perfect way to pull off this structure, the structure itself has some issues, so it's time we stop gushing over the game and explore... Ghost of Tsushima puts all the small pieces that work in so many games all into one and touches them up to fit into its world. And that results in it basically succeeding in everything it tries to do, but that also means that the game doesn't give too much of its own input on how to rectify issues that are found in the games that it borrows from. Ghost of Tsushima's structure is... how do I put this? Uh, uh, oh, uh, it, it looks like we're getting some kind of important weather report? Uh, uh, let's check in with our weather expert Jonathan. John? Thanks, Steve. Pandemonium in the streets. Thousands left concerned on the island of Shushima as it appears a strange sinister cloud is forming just outside of the mainland. Hurricane Ubisoft, as it's being called, is primed to make its way directly to the center of the island and rain down multiple inquisitive question marks throughout this entire region. And if previous disasters are anything to go by, it seems that about 700 of these indicators will be fox dens. It seems like the island of Shushima, much like my aunt who I haven't expressed my true feelings for, is getting foxier by the minute. Back to you, Bob. Thanks, Jason. See, while Ghost of Tsushima executed the Ubisoft open world formula better than I'd argue Ubisoft does itself, there's no way around the fact that the base that Ghost is built on, the skeleton of its existence, is much like Papyrus from Undertale, a skeleton with plenty of flaws. By the time you're doing basically anything that isn't a main story mission past halfway through the game, there's no way you haven't done the same thing at least 10 times before at that point. Although Ghost makes these activities make sense, like I mentioned earlier, that doesn't negate their repetitiveness, especially since so many of them don't introduce 
lot of variety amongst themselves. The shrines were my favorite open world activity because each of them was a different parkour section that you could work your way through, but hot springs or haikus, for example, are only different in their voice lines. The actual activity itself is very repetitive, and that's even more true for stuff like fox dens. On top of that, any side quests that aren't with your core cast of characters are painfully low effort and bland. It's just always, go get me a thing, go find a person, ah, sorry, that, that person was dead. Damn. One of the ways they really could have spiced things up is by putting more emphasis on the mythical quest, but unfortunately these all followed very similar patterns. They had some really fun new ideas here, like trying to locate something using a picture so there wasn't an exact map marker, but all of these ended really abruptly and didn't have the opportunity to be fleshed out very much. Side quests with main characters were solid, but they could often feel like filler. They were cut up into multiple missions, and I swear some of the missions were just like, talk to the dude. Okay, you're done. The game does the classic Ubisoft thing of having a sick opening and you're riding through the field like, holy shit, this is about to be the greatest game of life in ever. But then you spend the next 10 hours barely eking forward on the important stuff because the game hits pause and says, okay, here's a bunch of other dudes who have their own problems that aren't as interesting as yours, but you gotta hang out with them for a bit so we can increase your playtime. Again, these quests weren't bad, but they're ways for the game to basically shift to its B-list elements for a large chunk of time between its juicier parts, which just always throws up the pacing. I would have really liked it if Sucker Punch had decided to tweak the open world Ubisoft system to be a bit more interesting for the player. Like, for example, in an early mission, you're meant to kind of scope out a camp and see where you can enter from and how you can take on this place that's swarming with enemy soldiers. Now, the mission basically has exact places where it wants you to look, and this whole scenario ends up being pretty linear, but imagine if Sucker Punch had incorporated more strategy into the Ubisoft camp system. Instead of making every camp feel basically the same, they could have all been handcrafted. Perhaps with exploitable back entrances or weak structures that you could collapse for kills or distraction, or barrels of wine to poison if you could sneak in properly. With each camp layout being slightly different in ways that actually matter, and you needing to actually plan out your strategy for each one. You could probably put detecting some of this stuff like weak walls in the skill tree, and you could also use frightened mongols that you meet in the open world to not just tell you where camps are, but also hint at weaknesses that it might have. In doing so, the monotony that comes hand in hand with some of these design decisions disappears at least for one major world activity. And it's ideas like this which Ghost of Tsushima lacks, which makes it hard for me to say that the game does much more than Frankenstein other games together and add in nice set dressing and world cohesion. Even when the game introduces nice quality of life ideas like the ease of mapless exploration or a somewhat more enjoyable solution to difficulty, it doesn't address a lot of the underlying problems with its foundation, nor does it give us any truly innovative major mechanics to chew on. So its Frankensteining creates a really great product, but also one that doesn't feel like it does anything truly exceptionally. Especially when the game's story doesn't carry it like other acclaimed titles vis-a-vis -vis The Last of Us or Red Dead 2. Ghost of Tsushima's story is really fun and satisfying to play through, but it never dives as deep as it could into its complex themes, and spends way too much time letting the story simmer in the background as you do other quests for it to have the impact that you'd want from it. While making this video, I decided to go over to my small pile of physical games and randomly point to three of them to see if I could find their most unique elements and how important they ended up being to the game's enjoyment. And the three I landed on were Prey, Spider-Man PS4, and Shadow of Mordor. And I know that game came up earlier in this video, but that's just a weird coincidence, I promise. I don't know how it happened, but it did. It was actually surprisingly easy to find the most unique elements of all three of these games. Maybe I got lucky with the ones I wound up with, but regardless, the conclusion I came to for the three was this. Mimics, the little alien creatures that can transform into any object which makes you feel perpetually threatened for the entirety of Prey. Web swinging, which completely completely transforms the way you traverse the world and is one of the only systems out there that makes just going around places a genuine treat. And I know you could argue this isn't unique because it's in all Spider-Man games, but if you're familiar with this game, you know that the way that it's pulled off here is wildly different from anything that came before it. And finally, the Nemesis system, a groundbreaking system that I'm surprised no one's really iterated on, which gives enemies their own progression paths and motivation and grudges against you, and makes the opposing side feel as fleshed out as the hero side for once. And once I came to these conclusions, I immediately came to another one. These were all kind of the best parts of these games. Not every new idea that's put forward by a game is a winner, but the good games are made great through their breakthroughs. Ghost of Tsushima is not worse than any of these games in my opinion, although that discussion is open and these are some really, really stellar games we're talking about here. And the reason I think it's not worse is because of everything I talked about in the last section. It does everything it wants to basically as well as you could hope for, but the game is stopped short from its potential in my eyes because it also doesn't have the X factor that any of these games 
humans do. Those are my thoughts on Ghost of Tsushima, the game. But to wrap the video up, I wanted to go past that and discuss a specific part of the reaction and reception to this game that wound up in the realm of toxic positivity, or as I described it earlier on, disrespectful praise. Ghost of Tsushima launched on July 17th, 2020, a mere month away from another major PlayStation exclusive. The Last of Us Part 2. Yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah, I know. This video isn't gonna get into The Last of Us Part 2 at all. If you really wanna know my thoughts on the game, I have a separate video on it, but as I'm sure most of you know, this game is incredibly controversial, and a lot of people were trying to find ways to put it down early on, including review bombing the game before they had played it. The Last of Us Part 2 and Ghost of Tsushima are pretty different games. They have entirely different gameplay experiences. One features a linear world, one is open world, the settings are vastly different. Most major elements of these two games are not all that similar to one another. But because they were released so close together and they were both bubble term third person action adventure games published by Sony, they were intrinsically connected to a degree. And the part that really bugs me about the reception of Ghost of Tsushima is that an uneasy amount of its praise was used to attack The Last of Us 2 rather than give it its flowers on its own. Looking through the positive user scores for Ghost of Tsushima, I went through the entire first page and found any mention I could of The Last of Us, its acronym, its developer Naughty Dog, and hell, even the word political since... Uh, if you're familiar with the whole Last of Us situation, you know why I did that. Every single one of these mentions, and no, I did not cherry pick these, was the user taking a dump on that game and saying that Ghost ran it out of the water, which really shouldn't apply because, like I said, these are very different games. Now, considering The Last of Us 2 actually has more positive ratings than negative ones on Metacritic, you'd assume that at least a few of these instances of this game being mentioned would be positive or even just be as an example of a game that came out this year, which we see from another PlayStation duo in 2018, God of War and Spider-Man. These game releases weren't quite as close, but Sony's properties were the bee's knees this year, so some kind of mention would make sense. And every mention of God of War in these reviews on the first page, of which there are less, comes off like an example of a game that came out this year more than an excuse to write a hit piece. Hell, dude, Sony released two third-person action-adventure games on the same day last year, and in both of their first pages combined, the other game is only mentioned a total of one time. And again, it's just an example of another Sony game, that's all it is. You also get zero hits on any of these pages for studio names of the other games or the word political. Now you might be thinking, wow, did you really turn this whole Ghost of Tsushima retrospective into you crying that people were mean to The Last of Us 2? No. Like I said, this video isn't about The Last of Us 2. My beef doesn't come with people hating this game. It comes with taking a game that has nothing to do with The Last of Us 2, one that the developers have put so much time and effort and love into, and turning it into not much more than ammunition against something else. An even bigger demonstration of this is found in the Player's Vote Award from last year at the Game Awards. Now personally, I wasn't pulling for either of these two games. I wanted Hades to win. But my second pick was actually Ghost because I knew people really vibe with this game, I really loved it too, and I knew it wasn't going to win the official award, so I was hoping that Sucker Punch could see the profound impact that their game was having, since they deserved it. Well, the final round of voting saw The Last of Us 2 in a very comfortable lead near the end after a lot of voting had been done, up 43-31%. to 31%. And then suddenly, Ghost jumped up an insane amount. It pole vaulted to first place right at the end after The Last of Us' lead was tweeted out. And it doesn't really take an internet sleuth to find examples of places where people were explicitly saying to go vote for Ghost, which was currently in second place, so that they could make sure that The Last of Us didn't win, and as this Twitter user says, when it looked like The Last of Us 2 was winning yesterday, 4chan and the anti The Last of Us 2 subreddit mobilized to vote with multiple accounts. They produced an artificial 20 plus point spike in hours. I feel sorry for the game's producers that it was used in this way. Yeah. Exactly. Imagine spending six years on a passion project for it to come out as good as this game and over and over you see people using it for this reason. Wondering if you even deserved this award and if people really resonated with your project to this degree or if a significant chunk of it was artificial. This game was constantly linked to The Last of Us and so much of its praise was spiteful in nature towards something it had nothing to do with. And to me, it really tainted the reception of the game. Ghost of Tsushima deserved to be treated well of its own accord. Critiquing the game is fine and I did it myself here but the love of this game should have come from the love of this game, not just as a way to hold a grudge. I encourage everyone to keep sending love and support to Sucker Punch, they have their new DLC coming out soon, and I hope they recognize that the game is still loved on its own by a vast majority of people, and that the ones who tainted its reception are just the loud minority. Thank you guys for watching, I hope you enjoyed, leave a like or a sub if you did, and I'll see you soon.